Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on the book of Daniel. Daniel is a very interesting book, and has, Adventists have spent a lot of time studying it, so I hope you're very familiar with it already. This is lesson number five in that series for February 1 of 2020, entitled, From Pride to Humility. I wonder which part of Daniel that might be about. Well, as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of coming here and talking together with friends and thinking about you. And then to think about these experiences that took place so many years ago and the lessons you might want us to learn. May we think through them carefully as our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I don't think it's too hard to figure out that in any war, there are two sides, at least two sides. And in the war that we call the Great Controversy, we obviously think of God and then Satan, or some people would say good and evil. But there's also basic principles behind each of those governments. And this basic, very basic principle of those two governments are the following. For God, it's love. For Satan's side, it's selfishness. We need to keep those things in mind as we think about this lesson. Pride has been called the first great sin. If you remember what it says in Daniel, I'm sorry, in Revelation 12, we believe that the great controversy actually started where? In heaven. heaven. In heaven, right there. Lucifer thought that he was good enough so that he should be equal with Jesus Christ or even take his place. And that's from Ezekiel 28, 17. And why, did, why did he do that? Why was it possible for Lucifer to do that? Well, it wasn't possible by any rational, sane thinking, but he thought it was possible because he was standing next to God's throne and Jesus stood on the other side of God's throne and he, Jesus moved among the angels as Michael the archangel, so he thought, well, you know, I'm an angel too. I would use a little shorter answer, and that is God is love. Mm -hmm. And without choice, there is no love. Mm -hmm. And that, the freedom that it go, comes with, with love is a lot of people have uh, not addressed it. I, I can't understand it all, but uh, I like the Ellen White's quotation there. The, uh, what is it? Chapter 29, A Great Controversy. If you could find an excuse for what Satan did, it would, wouldn't be sin. Wouldn't be sin. Yeah. But yeah. that's part of the mystery of iniquity, how it yeah. all started. And that's something that in our finite minds, it isn't, there's no logic to it. Yeah. Well, so pride. Pride, jealousy, and selfishness are three different manifestations of the same kind of sin led to Satan's fall and all the evil that has come from it. Are we, us, willing to admit in our day that everything good that we might have ever done and all the capacities or capabilities that we have to do good or evil were all given to us by God? In the life of a Christian, there should be no place for proud, boastful, arrogant behavior. But humility, we have to be honest, is not easy. Benjamin Franklin once wrote out a list. He had 13 things he wanted to accomplish in his life. The last one was to be humble. But he finally admitted defeat when he realized that he was proud that he was so humble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, in our lesson for this week, God takes a very unusual approach to dealing with Nebuchadnezzar's pride. He took away his kingdom and turned him into what essentially was an animal. But somehow, at the end of all that, his mind got straightened out again and he recognized the truth. But we need to be honest, lunacy or idiocy does not cause one to think clearly. At what point did he come to his senses and realize what had happened? Well, you've guessed by now probably that this lesson is based on Daniel 4. 33 verses. So we start out, God gives Nebuchadnezzar another dream, and this time he was able to remember it. We do not know why his experts could not give him, give him an interpretation. Was it because they realized the implications of the dream and were afraid to tell Nebuchadnezzar? That's a distinct possibility. 
Or did God prevent them from seeing the implications? That's another distinct possibility. When Daniel realized the import of the dream, his first words were, Your Majesty, I wish that the dream and its explanation applied to your enemies and not to you. Wow. I mean, you know, I, I have a very good friend that I work with. And today, well, actually late last night, late yesterday afternoon, and again this morning, I had to tell him that there's a possibility that he has cancer. Mm. And that's not easy. No. That is not easy. While interpreting the dream for him, Daniel said these words to King Nebuchadnezzar, let his heart be changed from that of a man, let him be given the heart of the beast, and let seven times pass over him. Do you think either Daniel or Nebuchadnezzar realized the implications of that sentence at that time? Probably hmm. not. Probably not. Well, we know that plants and especially trees are often used in the Bible as symbols for kings or even nations or empires. Ezekiel 17 talks about Israel's relationship with Babylon and Egypt as a discussion about trees. Ezekiel 31 describes Egypt as a tree. Hosea 14 describes Israel as a tree. The country of Lebanon has been famous for its trees for thousands of years. You can read about that just one of the places, Zechariah 11, 1 and 2. Jesus himself talked about the wood from trees in, in very important ways in Luke 23, 31. Well, 12 months went by. And what do you think was happening during those 12 months? Nebuchadnezzar is carrying on with building up his building. his famous Nebuchadnezzar, I mean his famous Babylon. But then one day he's walking up, probably on the roof of his palace, and he said, "Open and you can see the quote here, the words quote, look how great Babylon is. I built it as my capital city to display my power and might, my glory and majesty." That's from the Good News translation, Daniel 4:30. Well, maybe the most dangerous thing about pride and selfishness is that we tend to forget God. Daniel had very clearly warned the king and told him specifically what things he needed to deal with. And what did he tell him? Daniel yeah. 7? Yeah, Daniel 4, 27. So then, your majesty, followed my advice. Stop sinning so that what is right and... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Stop sinning. Do what is right and be merciful to the poor and you will continue to be prosperous. Wow. So, does that suggest that maybe that was one of his major sins? Probably, right? Why do you think Nebuchadnezzar's treatment of the poor was the thing that stands out in this interpretation of the dream? Well, it's something to do for others. Um, it's not enough to just stop doing whatever you have to put something positive in its place. And, and well, so doing something, instead of, if you're selfish, then you turn inwards. If you're going to help the poor, then you turn outward. So okay. there can be something that happens in just doing that that begins to change yep. your mind. I like think that previous text, Daniel 4.30, shows yeah. you where Nebuchadnezzar's mind was. Yep. It was all about him. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and how, how, how heavily did he tax his people to be able to afford to have a beautiful palace and all of these beautiful gardens? I mean, Well, just wait. We've hardly heard about anything yet. <laughs> There's no question about the fact that ancient Babylon was one of the wonders of the ancient world. Marvelous accomplishments took place there. Margaret? But such splendor and beauty, at least in part, is accomplished through exploitation of slave manpower and neglect of the poor. Furthermore, the wealth of the empire is used to, to gratify the pleasures of the king and his entourage. Thus, the pride of Nebuchadnezzar not only prevents him from acknowledging God, but as a consequence also makes him oblivious to the hardships of those in need. Given the special care that God shows for the poor, it is not surprising that from the other possible sins that Daniel could have highlighted before the king, he singled out the sin of neglecting the poor. 
And this is from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Monday, January 27. Okay. The next quote comes from Josephus, as quoted in the Adult Teacher Sabbath School Lesson, fourth quarter, page 48. And this quote from Josephus, Babylon covered an area of approximately two square miles. The total length of its inner and outer walls was about 13 miles long. The double wall fortifying the city measured more than 96 feet in width. That's a lot that's, of chariots. Well, around that's a lot of chariots. And that's Bible commentary. It was a religious center without rival. A cuneiform tablet of Nebuchadnezzar's time lists 53 temples dedicated to important gods, 955 smaller sanctuaries, and 384 street altars all of them within the city confines. It try to imagine yes. that. There had to be something on every, several on each street and corners. Just amazing. Center of Babylon's glory was the famous <laughs> temple tower of Etenmenanki, dedicated to the god Marduk, which was 300 foot square at the base and more than 300 feet high. In ancient times, it was only surpassed by the two great pyramids at Giza in Egypt. Neb's reputation as a builder has been preserved in the writings of the Babylonian priest Barosius. That's from Josephus. Mm -hmm. That's quoted from a study on the book of Daniel way back in 2004. As you might suspect, biblical critics have dismissed this chapter as pure nonsense because they claim there is no extra biblical verification for it. However, a Babylonian cuneiform text published in 1975, when we say published, we mean that it was found and someone read it, figured out how to read the cuneiform, and then published it in available to the public, may refer to Nebuchadnezzar's madness. The text states that the king gave contradictory orders, refused to accept counsel, showed love neither to son or daughter, neglected his family, and no longer performed his duties as head of state. Seems like he's a manic depressive to me. Yeah. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's from an article by Siegfried Horn, one of the, the Adventist father of archaeology in Ministry Magazine, April 8, 1978, page 40. Uh, it's from A.K. Grace in Babylonian History, uh, literary text, uh, published by Toronto in Toronto Buffalo in, in 1975. Oh, so yeah. okay. That's further. I mean, that's where Horn got it from. I see. Okay, good. Because this uh, gentleman, A.K. Grayson, is the one who. And where who did he print it? Did you say? Uh, he published it in Babylonian History Historical Literary Texts, whatever oh, okay. that is. Sure, it's a uh, book. And then it says Toronto Buffalo, which is apparently where the publishing house was in 1975. Yeah. Okay. Okay, oppression of the poor was a disease affecting almost every nation and many, many of the kings and wealthy people in ancient times. We just studied something about that in Nehemiah 5, last quarter. Could a true Christian really exploit the poor? The poor are also the children of God. I mean, you know, don't we, all, don't we claim that we're all children of God? Mm -hmm. The poor are just as much as we are. Jim? By serving others with our possessions, we honor God and recognize His Lordship. It is God's ownership that should ultimately determine the value and function of material possessions. This is where Nebuchadnezzar fails, and we risk failing too, unless we recognize God's sovereignty over our accomplishments and manifest our recognition of this reality by helping those in need. Okay. So let's think about that a minute. How do you recognize the Lord's ownership by the way you use your possessions? Well, you can use them to amplify your own ego mm -hmm. for yourself. As many or do. Or you can be unselfish and use them for worthy causes. That uh, You have to be a little critical, I think, sometimes. We get so many pleas for money. Uh, yeah, you have to be you have to be cautious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the story goes on. 
Daniel 4, 20, starting with verse 28, all this did happen to King Nebuchadnezzar. Only 12 months later, while he was walking about on the roof of his royal palace in Babylon, he said, look how great Babylon is. I built it as my capital city to display my power and might, my glory and majesty. But that's not the end of the story. Before the words were out of his mouth, a voice spoke from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, listen to what I say. Your royal power is now taken away from you. You will be driven away from the human society to live with wild animals and eat grass like an ox for seven years. Then you will acknowledge that the supreme God has power over human kingdoms and that he can give them to anyone he chooses. The words came true immediately. Nebuchadnezzar was driven out of human society and ate grass like an ox. The dew fell on his body and his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails as long as bird's claws. Oh. Wow. He's a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> we, most of the time, we think. Do you think Nebuchadnezzar's condition during those seven years was somehow a natural result of his pride? Or was that condition caused by a specific action of God? You know where the Bible says you can't serve God and mammon? Mm -hmm. I think that when you become double-minded trying to do both, mm -hmm. I think mental illness can happen. You can't have two loyalties. You can't yeah. be yeah. loyal to... Yeah. For example, you can't be a believer in the Creator God and be a Freemason. Yeah. Mm. That's just one example, but think of, you could apply that as a principle. You can only have one, yeah. like the needle to the pole. Well, there are some diseases known as species dysphorias. Those are not commonly known, which cause people to think that they are in the wrong species and wanting to be animals. Two specific examples have been named within the following definitions in Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary. Here's a couple of possibilities. Have you ever heard of lycanthropy? A delusion that one has become a wolf, and two, the assumption of the form and characteristics of a wolf held to be possible by witchcraft or magic. Or zoanthropy, a, mo a monomania in which a person believes himself changed into an animal and acts like one. Wow. Do we have other examples of individuals or groups avoiding serious problems like this one because they repented? Now, Nebuchadnezzar didn't repent, did he? So he ended up with his seven years of animal behavior. But there are other people who did repent. What happened to them? Jim? Um, or that's... Second Kings no, I'm sorry, that's Jackie. 20, verse 2 to 5. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed, Oh, remember, Lord, that I have served you faithfully and loyally and that I have always tried to do what you wanted me to. And he began to cry bitterly. Now, let's back up a second. What, wh why was he on his bed here? Do you remember the story? Isaiah had told him that he was going to die. Yeah. He had a, apparently some kind of abscess or whatever, and he was seriously sick, and Isaiah came to him. God sent Isaiah there and said, you're going to die. Put your house in order. Put your house in order. Okay, go ahead. So Isaiah left the king, but before he had passed through the central courtyard of the palace, the Lord told him to go back to Hezekiah, ruler of the Lord's people, and say to him, I, the Lord, the God of your ancestor David, have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you, and in three days you will go to the temple. Wow. Okay, so here's a case of an individual who was given in an ultimatum basically by God and because he repented in tears God said okay I accept that see what do you think within the hour almost by the time he's Isaiah's walking out of the palace too long for Isaiah to tell him initially what the Lord said he prays and immediately Isaiah is given a message to take back to him amazing pretty amazing yeah Really is. Okay. And Dennis? we have a couple other texts here. Jonah three ten, God saw what they did. He saw that they had given up their wicked behavior, so he changed his mind and did not punish 
them as he had said he would. That's and that's talking about what? Nineveh. Talking about Nineveh. What was, what was Jonah's message to Nineveh? Forty days. Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed, destroyed. right? Yeah. Wow. And what happened? They repented. They repented. Okay. What else? In Jeremiah 18, 7 to 8, the Lord said, If it, at any time I say that I am going to uproot, break down, or destroy any nation or kingdom, but then that nation turns from its evil, I will not do what I said I would. What I said I would. Okay, so what, what kind of prediction is that, would you say? Conditional. 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 What we call conditional prophecy. And... God is trying to get people's attention, trying to get them straightened out, and that's, sometimes he has to do that. Well, despite the fact that Nebuchadnezzar had already seen the superiority of Yahweh over all human beings and over all false gods, on three different occasions it seems he had to learn the hard way. So what were the three occasions? Well, the first one was at the graduation ceremony, right? And somehow or other, these four young Jewish gentlemen exceeded all his other specialists from wherever they came from. And so he put them in charge of the palace and the kingdom and so forth. And what was the next time? The plan of Dura with the three young men in the fire. Well, no, you, that that's, that's true, the, but you jumped over dream, one. The, the dream that he... That yeah. he could couldn't not remember. remember, and he knew that that it was significant, and he was determined to find out what it was and what it meant. And what did he say to the people when they couldn't interpret his dream? I'm, I'm going to kill all of you with your heads. <laughs> <laughs> so they get, this gives us a little feel for. I mean, these ancient kings and emperors, they they you know they just felt like, you know, they had the full right to order whatever they want, and you just that was it. Oh, but wow. he said no to them, and so they got they used to they doing whatever, whatever yeah. they could. And then the, the, the thing we talked about last week on the plain of Dura, right? So at some point you would have thought, King Nebuchadnezzar, hmm, is he getting the picture or not? He's made, he's made some pretty strong statements about how important God was at the end of each one of these stories. Yeah. So now we come to, uh, and, and Nebuchadnezzar once again realized that this was a kind of God like nothing he'd ever seen before. And we have Daniel 4, 34 to 37. Okay, Daniel 4, 34 to 37 says, When the seven years had passed, said the king, I looked up at the sky, and my sanity returned. I praised the supreme God and gave honor and glory to the one who lives forever. He will rule forever, and his kingdom will, will last for all time. He looks on the people of the earth as nothing. That sounds like he's a prophet. Angels in heaven mm -hmm. and people on earth are under his control. No one can oppose his will or question what he does. When I'm, I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. Who's speaking here? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. So it looks like this part of Daniel 4 is actually a letter or a, a pro proclamation made by Nebuchadnezzar himself. Right. That's right. That's something. Mm -hmm. So do we have a part of our Bible written by a yeah. pagan king? Yes. Or repented. And quoted. Yes. He wow. would have he written was this. He was quoted. He would have written this after the fact, in yeah. which case he was con finally converted. Cause yeah. Well, let, point, we're going to yeah. talk about that in a few minutes. Yeah. So. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, when my sanity returned, my honor, my majesty, and the glory of my kingdom were given back to me. My officials and my noblemen welcomed me, and I was giving, given back my royal power with even greater honor than before. And now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, honor, and glorify the King of Heaven. Everything he does is right and just, and he can humble anyone who acts proudly. I wonder who From he was thinking. The Good think News Bible. I wonder what he was, who was he thinking about there in that last sentence? Himself. So. I wonder if he kept that philosophy. Yeah. So l let's ask a couple of questions. People had now, I'm sure, watched him 
Some people had, had, I'm sure the kids probably watched him, and they watched all the crazy thing he'd been doing for for seven years, and all of a sudden he comes out with this. Would they be inclined to think, Carrie, you were in the mental health field, would you be inclined to think that, okay, this craziness has affected his mind? Yes. <laughs> you, you might be inclined to think that, right? Yeah. Well... This appears to be a kind of letter sent out by Nebuchadnezzar to describe what had happened to him and the results. Somehow at the end of that experience, everything changed. And boy, that's a good question. You don't, people who go through that kind of experience don't normally come out with, you know, better intelligence and smarter no. whatever. Uh, but God, God accomplished what he needed to accomplish somehow through that whole thing. Have you ever wondered what people thought when they saw Nebuchadnezzar in that condition eating grass like an animal? Seven years they saw him. Yeah. Here's a quote from Ellen Plyatt, Prophets and Kings 520. For seven years, Nebuchadnezzar was an astonishment to all his subjects. For seven years, he was humbled before all the world. Then his reason was restored, and looking up in humility to the God of heaven, he recognized the divine hand in his chastisement. In a public proclamation, he acknowledged his guilt and the great mercy of God in his restoration. I think it's pretty amazing that he was restored. Yeah. So he had some, probably some help from Daniel and the other. Yeah, I mean, we don't know who was in charge of the government while that thing. I mean, and, uh, you know, I. Maybe my mind is too wild and active, I don't know. But I think, you know, if you were a young a bunch of young teenage guys, particularly, living in Babylon, it would be very likely during this time, okay, let's go see what the king's doing now. You know, you can imagine a bunch of guys doing that, out there and watching him, look at that, eating grass and acting like a donkey or whatever, you know. Um, and and why would after that would you would you say well, okay now we we want him back as our king again? Yeah, that seems hard to understand. I wonder if Daniel had kind of kept him shielded from you know all of the spectators it's po it's and all this and and kept him from getting hurt and and I mean with a little luck someday maybe we'll find out. Yeah. Well, Daniel had interpreted the dream, so he, yeah, knew, he knew when he knew it what happened, was what, what was coming, what was going on here. So, yeah, and that it would end after seven years. So, I like the King James translation of this particular verse, Daniel four thirty four. I Nebuchadnezzar lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned to me. What do you think is implied by that? Was out of his mind for a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, and he came out of it when he turned his his gaze to heaven, right. to God, yeah. mm -hmm. instead of his kingdom. Of yeah. What I had done. Yep. Seven years is a long time. Seven years is a long time. Uh, I mean, and how would you survive the winters and so forth? I mean, things get pretty. Co and the summers are scorching hot. If I don't know, at least they are now in that part of the world. I don't know what they were in those days. Well, despite Nebuchadnezzar's previous encounters with the God of Heaven, <coughs> God was still merciful and kind and gave him this final opportunity to change his attitudes. Nebuchadnezzar was restored to his royal office, and we do not know who was in charge of the kingdom during those seven years. Could it have been Daniel? Mm -hmm. Most Oriental potentates, after ruling for seven years, would not have been willing to restore the kingdom to the previous ruler. You know, if you get rid of the previous ruler and you're new, the, now the new king, you don't want anything. I mean, you want that guy to be gone. You want him to be dead. It had to be Daniel. I, it, it's hard to imagine how it could have been anybody else. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Unless, I'm, there's a possibility that Nebuchadnezzar just fled a long ways away and people didn't know who he was. I, I mean, like the idea that Daniel took over. Yeah. Well, you out there, have you ever had the experience of being humbled by God? What did you learn from that? 
So what was Nebuchadnezzar's final conclusion? Daniel 4.35 states, He looks on the people of the earth as nothing. Angels in heaven and people on earth are under his control. No one can oppose his will or question what he does. That's from the Good News Bible. Wow. Okay, now the big question. You think Nebuchadnezzar will be in heaven? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it. His statement, which we just read, well, that one right there, basically, is the very last things we have recorded about Daniel, about Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. Nothing beyond that. Well, if he is, it'll be quite interesting to hear him give a personal testimony of what happened to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we have any evidence that he might be in heaven? It seems like there was something in the New Testament that mentions, I can't remember. Yeah? What? what do you think? I don't remember anything. Okay, so let's think about some possibilities. If you scan through ancient writings, you will discover that it is almost unheard of for any words to be spoken against a ruling king. And for a ruling king to admit his errors and talk about his downfall and his pride and insanity is absolutely unique. Ooh. Nebuchadnezzar had become an evangelist for the true God. Almost a prophet in some yeah. of those words he spoke. Yeah. What will happen? Wow. Well, shouldn't we as Christians be followers of the example of Jesus? Shouldn't we have a similar experience? Well, let me just read you some words that I want you to think about. Philippians 2. Your life in Christ makes you strong, and his love comforts you. This is Paul writing from prison in Rome to his friends from Philippi. What had happened to him in Philippi, do you remember? Jailer. Jail. That's where he ended up in jail and all that stuff with the with the woman that was, you know, possessed and so forth, and he casts the demons out of her, and then he gets thrown into jail and gets beaten, and, and then that experience with the jailer and so forth, that whole thing. So these people were very close friends of his. So he said, you have fellowship with the Spirit, and you have kindness and compassion for one another. I urge you then to make me completely happy by doing what? Having the same thoughts, sharing the same love, and being one in soul and mind. Don't do anything from selfish ambition. Does that sound a little bit like Nebuchadnezzar? Mm. Or from a cheap desire to boast, but be humble towards one another, always considering others better than yourselves. And look out for one another's interest, not just for your own. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had, and here it is, he always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, so how did they, in heaven, how, how did it happen that Jesus decided to come to this earth? Do you remember what we're told? Hmm. They had a council in heaven. The Godhead met together, and they decided. They decided that he would come down. Mm -hmm. So instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had, took the nature of a slave, literally. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. And Phillips translates that, the death of a common criminal. Crucifixion is the very worst kind of death that the Roman government could, find, could figure out to try to to humiliate anybody who tried to oppose the king. So the idea was that Jesus was claiming to be a king, so therefore you crucify him. Wow. For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. And so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees. How do, who does that include? Me. Everybody. Everyone's including Satan. Satan himself, because it includes the world below, will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Does that include all the wicked? Yes. All the righteous? Yes. All the angels? Every knee. Good ones, bad ones, 
every knee, including Satan. So what are we talking about there? And I just want to make a point here. We're talking about the final successful conclusion to the great controversy. God cannot wrap things up until every single person who has ever lived is convinced that he has done everything he can to po po can possibly do to save as many as possible. And at that point, when everyone says, God, you did everything you could possibly do, then God says, okay, now we can, now we can wrap it up. And there's some more words about that, Jim. The once proud monarch had become a humble child of God, their tyrannical, overbearing ruler, a wise and compassionate king. He who had defied, blasphemed the God of heaven, now acknowledged the power of the Most High and earnestly sought to promote the fear of, God, of Jehovah and the happiness of his subjects. Can I interrupt for just a second? So who else is going to do that at the very end of time? That's exactly what happens to Satan, right? He's tyrannical, overbearing. Now he's going to be becoming, he's not going to become a wise, compassionate ruler, but uh, he's going to acknowledge and blaspheme. He's been a defied and blasphemed God, now acknowledges the power of the Most High. Go ahead. Under the rebuke of him who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Nebuchadnezzar had learned at last the lesson which all rulers need to learn, that True greatness consists in true goodness. He acknowledged Jehovah as the living God, saying, I, never could have, I Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol the, and honor the King of heaven. All whose words are true, excuse me, are truth and his ways judgment, and those who walk in pride he is able to abase. God's purpose that the greatest kingdom in the world should show forth his praise was now fulfilled. This public proclamation in which Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged the mercy and goodness and authority of God was the last act of his life recorded in sacred history. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Pro excuse me, Prophets and Kings 521. Wow. Well, historical records show that Nebuchadnezzar ruled Babylon for more than twice as long as all his successors put together. There's no evidence that any of them learned the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar learned. And we have this again from, um, this is from C.S. Lewis. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Does this seem to you, to you exaggerated? If so, think it over. The more pride one had, the more one disliked pride in others. In fact, if you want to find out how proud you are, the easiest way is to ask yourself, how much do I dislike it when other people snub me or refuse to, ta to take any notice of me or shove their aura in or patronize me or show off? The point is that each person's pride is in comp competition with everyone else's pride. It is because I wanted to be the big noise at the party that I am so annoyed at someone else being the big noise. <laughs> Two of a trade never agree. That's from his famous book, Mere Christianity, as quoted in the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Friday, January 31. Well, in this lesson, there are three main themes that stand out. The dangers of pride, the advantages of humility, and the sovereignty of God. Jackie? There is a Nebuchadnezzar in everyone. Oh, boy. To overcome pride and become humble is an ideal we cannot achieve in human terms. Humility is an elusive goal. As soon as we think we have reached it, it is already lost. But Jesus can give us power to overcome our arrogance and live a humble life. He can change every temptation to pride into an opportunity for gratitude. Wow. And this is Hearing the Message of Daniel, Christopher J. H. Wright. Okay, as soon as we think we have reached it, it is already lost. Does that remind you what we said about Benjamin Franklin? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. His thirteenth thing was to be humble, and what happened? He was proud that he was so humble. Yeah. I have a feeling that he wasn't that humble. 
Well, here's another one from him in his famous Poor Richard's Almanac. Almanac. He that falls in love with himself will have no rivals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love that. He that falls in love with himself will have no rivals. Well, so looking back at our story for today, why do you think God chose this way of disciplining Nebuchadnezzar? Doesn't it seem pretty extreme? It does. Because it was the way that worked. And uh, God, you know, uh, in some of what uh, Nebuchadnezzar says in, in this, he says that uh, you, uh, that nobody questions him, you know. Mm -hmm. In other words, and that's repeated in other places that can uh, you know the potter or the pot say to the potter why did you do do this mm -hmm. um, so God I don't know if we can get very far questioning why God did things the way he did well but okay let's think about that for a second we're in the middle of a great controversy and what what we have here is we have Satan making accusations against God and God trying to set the record straight, tell the truth. So how are we going to figure out who's telling us the truth? We have, to, we have to try to think God's thoughts after him, and once in a while we have to think Satan's thoughts after him. So we get an idea of what's, what's really going on in this great controversy. I don't see any other way we can really, we need to understand both, both sides enough at least, so that when it comes down to it, we can say no, I choose this and I do not choose that. Well, it depends on how you approach the situation. Is it yeah. to understand or to criticize? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dennis Prager, who's a Jewish uh, conservative commentator, has written uh, some comment, uh, commentaries on Genesis and Exodus. And in one, of, in, uh, the one on Genesis, he talks about um, debating a secular Jew mm -hmm. and uh, and he summarized the difference between the two and the other guy agreed that this is the difference and he said when the secular Jew reads the Torah and he sees something he disagrees with he thinks the Torah is wrong and Dennis said when I read the Torah and I see something I think is wrong I th or I disagree with I think the Torah is right and I am wrong yeah uh, so, I mean, there's a certain balance that you have to maintain there. Yep. But, uh, you still, are you in reverence of the scriptures or are you a critic? Yeah. And do you think that your opinion is, uh, in your way, is better well, than, than the other? Look what God would do. I, why, yeah. why did God do it that You know, if you yeah. take the attitude... Why did God do it that way? You know, mm -hmm. I would have done it some some other way. Surely He could have found another way to do this, and we could take that all the way to the cross. Yeah, but the way God dealt with Nebuchadnezzar seems to me that God saw potential in Nebuchadnezzar and what? realized what He would do for His cause. Because I don't think He deals with every person no. to the extreme like that. These are. Uh examples that we yeah. have of what God is capable of doing. How many people are wandering right eating grass we today, you know? We need to do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, 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 the only way I can put this together in my mind is to put it in the great con context of the great controversy and realize what's going on here. So God gives him a mental illness and then he heals him of his mental illness. That's amazing. And he humbly admitted the sovereignty of God over the entire universe, and it was restored to his throne. Each of those three events is quite amazing. See, that restoration seems like a miracle to me. Absolutely. In nature, that would not happen. No. No, it just wouldn't happen. And those of us in, in primary care and in the medical profession, we have to deal with people who have all kinds of mental illnesses every day. And I tell you, Someone who's spent, spent seven years thinking he's an animal, you don't immediately think, okay, this guy's going to come out with some really wise words. <laughs> <laughs>
Did he, did he even talk during those times? Did he lose his ability to, of speech? We don't know. It doesn't say. It, well, yeah, he, it doesn't say. He got say. it back because he was pretty profound. Yeah. When you read what he said, that, that's an amazing turnabout. Well, there's a lot. There's some people, critics, you can imagine. Okay, what would you do with this story if you were a biblical critic? Well, they've tried to figure out some way to reinterpret the seven years to mean something other than seven literal years. Well. If you try to say, well, it's a year, it's 360 days, and we're going to make each one of those 360 days into another year, make this prophetic time, well, I mean, there's no way Nebuchadnezzar could live that long to start off with. So people have gone around that question back and forth, and there's just no way to, to answer it except to say, no, it was seven literal years. So do we need a kind of Nebuchadnezzar experience in our lives today? I hope not. <laughs> you hope not, I Paul said, he, I die daily. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is a sense in which each day we need to, I mean, and, and he, he died, basically, you know, in terms of his, his function um, yeah. to, uh, as a human being. And, and so it was like he was resurrected from the dead almost. I think of his arguments with the Judaizers later in his career. I mean, he went just about as far from his attitudes as a Pharisee as a person could possibly go. You know, when if you go to back to Acts 15 and you see the Pharisees, a group of Pharisees had become Christians, and they were arguing everything they could to say, Judy, in order to be a Christian, you must be a Jew first, and then you can be a Christian. And th these are Pharisees. And Paul says, absolutely not. Here's the Pharisee of the Pharisees, and he's just yeah. destroying Judy, uh, uh, Phariseeism, if you will. Well, wasn't there any other way for God to bring Nebuchadnezzar to his senses except this extreme example? Wow. Okay. Margaret? Now, oh, I'm sorry, Janice? She, she has this yeah. bullets there. Uh, one, how do you evaluate your own accomplishments when compared to those of others. And I would say that, uh, uh, like Paul <coughs> says, oh, how did I lost my, f oh, here it is. For we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves. For when they measure themselves by themselves and compare mm -hmm. themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. So <laughs> uh, we, we have no room for comparing ourselves with others. Uh, that's Second Corinthians ten twelve. Yeah. How do you tell the difference between pride and high self ex self esteem? In First Corinthians eight one, he says, "Now, cons well, I'll skip over uh, the intro. Knowledge makes arrogant or puffs up, makes mm -hmm. it look bigger than it really is. It makes you look bigger than it really is, but love edifies or builds up. So the difference, as I see it, would be that pride." just is self-inflated and, mm -hmm. and drawing in. But now, right. now hold on a minute, Dennis. Aren't team okay. is the opposite. It's, it's having something to give. Aren't you a child of God? Isn't, yes. Shouldn't that give you some self, high self-esteem? Self, self I have, I'm a child of God, but uh, everything I have, as we just uh, read earlier, uh, it, we acknowledge is coming from God. Mm -hmm. So my self-esteem or worth comes from the fact that God has blessed me with every blessing in heavenly places, and I can impart those to others, and uh, and I give Him the glory. Whether whatever we do, we should do all to the glory of God, not yeah. to ourselves. Okay. Next, we need to move on. All right. Sorry. It's no, opinion, good. How can we show and experience genuine humility? What is the difference between humility and low self-esteem? Well, we read Philippians 2. I think that sums it up. What is the place of humility in church leadership? Wow. Do you think a humble leader can be respected and followed? Uh, well, we're, we come to serve, not to be served. So in what ways? And how often, how many church politics, well, I should maybe shouldn't call them politicians. How many church leaders have gotten to their positions because of politi politic politics? And is that 
What is that? Seems that to me we need a little humility in church leadership. Now, yeah. why would you say that? Well, the politics that we have going on right now in our church. We need humility all around because yeah. one of the words that I don't hear too much about is submit. Uh, submit yourself one to e to each another. Hebrews yeah. uh, 13, I think it is. Uh, submit yourself to your, le your leaders because they are the ones who watch over your soul. So there's a submission, a mutual submission that has to take place. It's not pointing the finger and saying, well, they need to submit or they need to be humble. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever heard of anybody doing that kind of stuff? Wow. It's, it's mm -hmm. human nature. Welcome. Anyway, yeah, yeah. We better move on here. <laughs> In what ways has Jesus taught humility? On what occasion did Jesus' ministry, did he exemplify humility in the most powerful way? And what and how can you learn from him? Well, that would be the washing of the feet. Washing the feet. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I wonder if the disciples ever finally realized that was God down there washing my feet. Eventually. I think eventually they figured it out. Amazing, just absolutely amazing. Uh, number five, what do you perceive to be the relationship between humility and forgiveness? How difficult it is, is it for you to forgive someone who offends you? Well, if your pride is wounded, then you don't want to forgive. And so you, you do have to humble yourself. And uh, just as God forgave us, we need to forgive others. Yep. Six. This lesson, week's lessons opens the possibility for some self-examination. Ask your class members to reflect on the following. Try to put yourself in the shoes of Nebuchadnezzar and ask yourself... Okay, Margaret. Okay, okay we're all going to pretend like we're Nebuchadnezzar for a few uh -oh. minutes here. Do I tend to take credit for certain accomplishments more than I deserve? In what ways do I tell my personal stories? Do I tell them to look better or more successful than I really am? I uh, have a statement that sort of illustrates that because I'm with gray hairs these days and I sometimes meet with my old classmates and tell people about stories of my past. And when you talk about that, the statement is, um, oh boy, now, how does it go exactly? Um, the older we get, the better we were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, next. What steps must I take in order to attain humility? Wow. Have there been any situations in my life in which I was humbled in ways that helped me to understand my limitations and hence to honor God? If so, how? Okay, now let's think about this for a minute. As we approach the end of this world's history, what is Satan trying to get us to do? Sin, yes, but especially to be as proud as possible. To look at self. To look yeah. to self. And what is God trying to get us to do? Look, to look at Jesus. How does, does God have ways of humbling us? Mm -hmm. what, what, what would be? Making us aware of our limitations. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So unless we understand our spiritual poverty, uh, we can't really can't enter into the kingdom, his kingdom. Yeah. And of course you quoted there from the, one of the Beatitudes. Yeah. yeah. Matthew five three. Yeah. So and even Jesus, if, if you read the Luke version of the first of the Beatitudes, blessed are you poor. Now, Matthew says poor in spirit, but Luke says, blessed are you poor. Why would he say that? I mean, we don't know exactly. Jesus, I'm sure, was speaking Aramaic, and what we have recorded is Greek. So we don't know exactly what he said, but why would he say, blessed are you poor? Well, it's... There are many ways to be poor. Mm -hmm. We can be poor in spirit. We can be poor in material goods. Yeah. And uh, so there's the temporal and the spiritual aspects. Maybe the poor have a better attitude about a lot of things in life. Don't their place don't in this we, life? Don't we need to recognize how 
you know, unworthy and poor we really are. And many times it seems like the poor, they find themselves in such situations where they see no way out. Mm -hmm. And so they pray to God and they rely more on God than, than the rest of us who kind of have things a lot easier. Yep. In need of nothing. Yeah. Rich and in need of nothing. So that's the reason why, in other words, the poor don't qualify to be a part of the Laodicean church. Oh, that, that's us, isn't it? Hmm. Okay. Who was it said that uh, God must really love the poor because he made so many of them? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really, yeah, yeah, quarters, yeah. It's, um, it's really sad. I can tell you that there's some parts of the world where people are just teeming. You go to India, you go to Sri Lanka. One time a friend of mine that I will, who will remain unnamed visited Sri Lanka where there are just millions and millions of people. And he was talking to one of the, our Adventist church leaders there and they were, they were driving slowly down a road while people are parting the way to let them get through. And he said to him, he says, well, do you ever think about how you're gonna reach all these people? And the Adventist pastor says, I try not to think about it. Mm. And what we don't realize is that there are people in great need right around us in yeah. our own yeah. culture yeah. that yep. have not been dealt fairly with, that have lost their jobs, that there's one woman we know of that's losing her home, her car, everything. Yeah. And she used to be a church worker, a Bible worker. Mm. Okay, Margaret. Part of our community. Okay, let's see, have there, did I, yeah. How often do I remember to give God the glory for everything that I may have accomplished? What can help me remember always to give glory to Him? And that's from Adult Teacher Sabbath School Study Guide. Um, so. I remember, I mean, when I think back of what, where I've been and what I've done, and I know it's only been God, through God's grace. Yeah. Is it, is it ever safe to have a, a high self-esteem? Well, you have to have confidence that what you have to give is, is came from God. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, the only basis on which we can be proud, if, if you want to call it that, is saying because we are children of God. Yeah. The children yes. of the king. Everything we... be pretty yeah. high esteem. When you Sons and daughters of God. Okay. We're running out of time. Let's pray. Oh. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for giving us these insights into our, ne our great needs to see examples of people like Nebuchadnezzar who had so many things that he enjoyed and could take advantage of, and yet you found it necessary to go through that incredible experience to humble him, and we hope one day that we'll find him in heaven and be able to ask him about all those experiences. But today we thank you for this chance to study his story. May it have a great, great good effect on each one of us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.